to um, uh, introduce my friend, Mr. Al Gore. Is it 
Are we really, do we really have to do this? Uh, and the second question is, if the answer to that one is yes, can we do it? Can I do it? Can the U.S. do it? Can the world do it? Is it possible we get 85% of our energy from coal and oil and gas? And how in the world can we do it? Well, the answer to both of those questions is what this slideshow is designed to provide. And again, spoiler alert, uh, the answer to both questions is yes. But as you go through uh, the first question, do we have to do it, um, don't get depressed. Uh, it's easy to, and depression can be paralyzing. Uh, but that's not uh, real helpful. Uh, but, but, there, but, but it is important to know why such a big and difficult change. The changes would be good for us. It really and truly, it's not just rhetoric. I mean, there are a lot of, it involves doing a lot of things that we need to do for other reasons anyway. But um, the answer to the second question toward the uh, last part of the slideshow about how we can do it, uh, it, it, really you should take heart from this and the one missing ingredient may well be you, no kidding. Uh, it, I remember when I was a young boy, grew up summers uh, on the farm in Smith County, Tennessee. I remember when I first heard the, the lyric, how many times must a man raise his head and say, you know, to pretend that he just doesn't see. I have botched the line, but you know the one I'm talking about. <laughs> I'll tell you, folk music played a dispositive role in resolving the central question about civil rights into a choice between what is clearly right and what is clearly wrong. And we are... There may be a very tiny percentage of human beings are just flat out evil. But, you know, way up in the 90% of us, when a question is finally resolved into a choice between what's right and what's wrong, the answer is foreordained. And there'll be all kind of people with a stake in not resolving the question into a binary choice. And they'll throw up smoke and like the squid ink and all of that and they'll try to fool people and they, you know, a lot of folks are like an audience uh, being entertained by a magician, uh, just, uh, you know, content to be deceived by someone who has a stake in ignoring the reality. But there are three things that have converged to radically change our circumstances here on this planet. We've quadrupled our numbers in less than a century. And that, that's being stabilized, and that's a success story in slow motion, believe it or not. I'm not going to get into that in the slides, but it really is. We're reducing child mortality and educating girls and empowering women and making fertility management available so that people can choose to have uh, the number of children they want and the safety of the children that they want. These powerful new technologies that, that seem, you know, it's... Uh, Jack Johnson wrote about TV, it seemed like magic at first, but uh, they're great, but 85% of it runs on carbon-based fuels, ancient stored sunlight, and the side effects are what's killing us here. And then the third converging factor is the emergence of a hegemonic ideology that spread worldwide, that exalts short-term decision-making and ignores the long-term costs and consequences of the choices that we're making uh, in industry and agriculture and politics and transportation and culture. Uh, and we can change all of those things. It does take an act of collective will. But you, you, you realize what's at stake here. I mean, uh, I'll get to it. <laughs> All right, if we could dim... Uh, now, these slides, uh, if you saw the movie that Davis Guggenheim made a few years ago, An Inconvenient Truth, you will have seen a few of these slides. If you've seen Kathy's 
presentations, you will have seen some of these slides. The vast majority of these are new and fresh. I keep updating it because unfortunately there's lots of fresh material. Uh, and by the way, well, you'll see that extreme weather events connected to climate really are one of the big game changers uh, in this. That people are looking at their whole cards and, and uh, as, as saying, as Melissa Etheridge saying, saying I, I need to wake up. Anyway, if you could turn these uh, lights down, we'll start with this first slide, which is uh, Earthrise. This picture was made on Christmas Eve in 1968. There's a wonderful video on, on YouTube <laughs> with the real-time uh, chatter in the Apollo capsule. They didn't land on the moon. This was the one before. This is one of the ones. This is the first one to circle the moon. And the chatter among the astronauts in the capsule, they're focused on the surface of the moon. They're tasked to uh, look at these uh, craters and everything. And <laughs> well, Bill Anders, uh, one of the astronauts, says, Look at that! And they look out the window and say, Get me my camera! Get me some color film! And they're digging around in the kit bags and, and then they lose it. And the and the space and then they get it out of another window and they're all scrambling, just like any of us on vacation looking at a beautiful <laughs> rainbow or something. They're trying to say, get me the camera. They finally did. Within 18 months of this picture being seen on Earth, the first Earth Day was organized, the Clean Air Act was passed, the Clean Water Act, the National Environmental Policy Act, it exploded in consciousness. And it's a it's a great image. This uh, is the last picture of the Earth taken by a human being uh, of the whole planet from outer space on the last Apollo mission, Apollo 17. And it's the only one where the uh, Earth and the Moon and the Sun are all lined up. And the difference is this one, uh, you know, the, the, the last one is part, partly in shadow as most of them are. This is the only one where the full disk is illuminated. This next one is, a, and it's the most commonly published photograph in all of human history by far. Uh, so this next one is the first home movie of our planet. This robotic spacecraft is leaving. You can see the, the uh, reflection of the sun. There's Australia coming up on Africa, heading towards South America, Antarctica at the bottom. Really pretty. This is uh, a quick time-lapse image from NASA. You can see the legend uh, at the bottom where uh, when the Industrial Revolution really shifted, the second Industrial Re Revolution shifted into high gear and burning all this coal and then oil joined up. And you can see the temperature rising in the, through the 90s and the 2000s and compared to the beginning. It, it's really quite a, a big uh, difference. The 12 hottest years on uh, record have all been within the last uh, 15 years. Uh, and Last year was the 37th consecutive year with temperatures above the 20th century average, and last month was the 347th consecutive month with a global temperature above the 20th century average. It was cold in the in the eastern part of the United Eastern two thirds of the United States in January. January globally was the fourth hottest January in the history in the recorded history of the world. So in recent years, we've been getting these extreme uh, temperatures, 122.4 degrees uh, in China, 124 degrees in Pakistan, in both Iraq and Iran, 127.4 degrees. Uh, in Mohenjo-Daro, Pakistan, 128 degrees. There are lots of similar examples. This is just a little small deal at uh, Reagan National Airport in Washington, DC, the passengers got on the plane and uh, got settled, and the flight attendant came on the PA and said, I'm sorry, everyone, but we're going to have to get back off the plane uh, because the runway melted. <laughs> and you can see the, the, the wheels uh, sunk into the asphalt there. I, I've got a whole bunch of examples of this that I won't show you, but uh, this uh, last uh, summer, their summer uh, in Australia, uh, last year was the hottest year in history, I'll show you that, in Australia. But they had to change the weather maps and they had to come up with a new color because uh, it got up to 128, 29 degrees. Uh, now this is from the space shuttle and it simply illustrates 
a, an important fact. Uh, the atmosphere is extremely thin. The, you, you know, you stand outside, you look up at the sky, it looks vast and limitless. And Carl said, the late Carl Sagan used to say, if you had a large globe with a coat of varnish, the thickness of that varnish would be about what the atmosphere is. And the reason that's important is we're filling that up with heat trapping pollution, mainly carbon-based uh, fuel. And th this, uh, some of you have seen this, it's just sort of the basics. The energy comes from the sun and light radiation and then it goes back out to space as infrared and some of it is trapped which is good that's why we're the Goldilocks planet compared to to uh, Mars it's too cold and Venus it's too hot we've got just the right amount of CO2 but uh, unfortunately you know we are burning all this carbon-based uh, fuel and so we're making that uh, collection of heat trapping gases much thicker and so it's trapping the outgoing heat and that's what this deal is all about. Now I'm not going to go through this slide, it's only intended to point out that it's not just the burning of coal and oil and gas, that's the main part of it, but it's also factory farming and industrial agriculture, uh, it, it, it's also landfills that are not managed right and it's beginning to involve uh, the melting of the permafrost. But the main part of it is the carbon emissions from fossil fuels. And they're building up so rapidly that the, we're, we're putting 90 million tons uh, spewing it into the atmosphere every single day as if the atmosphere of the Earth is an open sewer that can be used free of charge or complaint by anyone who wants to dump their waste into the Earth's atmosphere, have at it. That's our current global policy. 90 million tons every single day. And the accumulated amount of man-made heat trapping pollution that's up there now traps as much extra heat energy every day as would be released by 400,000 Hiroshima atomic bombs going off every 24 hours. <laughs> energy. And that is what's causing the temperatures to get warmer all over the world. Now, this is uh, one of the two complicated slides. I'm going to give you that warning. Some of you know studied statistics. I'm unfortunately statistics challenged. Uh, but if you're like me, here's the way they explained this to me. They took a base period for comparison of 30 years in the middle of the 1951 to 1980. These are normal days for those 30 years, warmer than normal, cooler than normal. Uh, so in the, in the 1980s, uh, it shifted. And then in the 1990s, it shifted further. And then in the last 10 years, it shifted further. So we still have cold days and these are what the statisticians call three standard deviation events. That's above my pay grade, but it's like winning the lottery. Uh, uh, no, well, I guess that's like winning the lottery, but we still get some really cold days. But the extremely hot days are as numerous now as the cooler than average days. And the bulk of them are warmer than average. These are the ones that are causing the extreme weather events. They used to cover 0.1% of the Earth's surface, now 10%, a hundred-fold increase. And that means that these extreme weather events are becoming much more common. Jim Hansen, probably the most distinguished climate scientist, says the European heat wave, Russian heat wave, uh, drought, etc. Every event now has a component of this extra heat energy. And you don't have to, you know, if, if, uh, if you're one of these people that buys the uh, malarkey that uh, scientists, the, all the scientists in the world are uh, crooks and engaged in some kind of conspiracy, what about business? Well, the two largest insurance companies, reinsurance companies in the world, Munich Re, it's the only plausible explanation. Swiss Re keeps us up at night. 
So, this is contributing to the extreme weather events. All storms now have an element of this, as I said. Here's a linkage between the climate crisis and the increased frequency and severity of extreme weather events. Number one, as CO2 uh, traps more heat, the temp that's 2,000 years of CO2, 2,000 years of temperature. Uh, most of it goes in the oceans. 90% of it goes into the ocean. Uh, and so, if you will recall, back in uh, the late fall, Super Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines, terrible, horrible tragedy. Windward of the Philippines, where that storm picked up its energy, was 5.4 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than normal. That's where all that came from. That's where the extra wind speed, the extra moisture, the extra downpour came from, right there. It was sitting right over that big hot spot. And of course, the tragedy is really difficult to comprehend. Uh, as of today, there are still four million homeless refugees in the Philippines, twice as many as uh, followed that terrible tsunami in the Indian uh, Ocean. And you know, they talk about adaptation. We have to do something to adapt for sure. But the, it, how long is it going to take them to get back on their feet? This is a poor country. And these things are happening in lots of places, including in our country, by the way. Uh, on October 29, 2012, the areas windward of New York and New Jersey were 9 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than normal. And that's where Super Hurricane Sandy came from. And I'll show you this uh, real uh, quick. Um, this was the most criticized moment in my movie. By the deniers. They could measure this precisely. Just as the scientists could predict precisely how much water would reach the levees in New Orleans. The area where the World Trade Center Memorial is to be located would be underwater. This is going to be a big and powerful storm. Millions of people are going to be affected all across the eastern seaboard. I think everybody is taking the appropriate preparations. Our thoughts and prayers go out to all people who are potentially affected. This extreme storm is related to the warmer ocean temperatures. Tropical storms get their energy from the oceans. Warmer oceans give it more energy. Explosion at a consolidated Edison power plant. More than a billion people in 11 states are already without power. Breaking news now from the borough of Queens, New York, where a fire there has destroyed at least 50 homes. The battery tunnel in lower Manhattan that gets you out of the city. Uh, the tunnel is totally flooded. And now this water is rushing over the edge of lower Manhattan. This was a devastating storm maybe the worst that we have ever experienced. Many people have lost their homes. People have lost their lives. The Hudson River, downtown Manhattan, was literally pouring into the Ground Zero site. All the infrastructure we have in this city is below ground. We don't have any built-in pumping capacity in the tunnel system. The electrical equipment in many cases is in the tunnel system, and now you have a serious problem. But uh, I would expect a situation like this to recur, and I think we need a systemic solution long term. As New Yorkers, we've gone through dark times before, uh, and, and we know struggles, and we know crisis. And we come back, and we come back even stronger. We work together, we work as a team. 
And the challenge here for us is not just to build back, but to build back better than before. Climate change is a reality. Extreme weather is a reality.
you know, uh, the large, these large downpours, the, the, what these guys, how they were reacting, people are having those kinds of visceral reactions all over the world. It's just out of the ordinary. They've never seen anything like it, what's happening. And the much bigger downpours cause much bigger floods. A few years ago in Pakistan, you may remember this, the biggest flood they had ever had, and 20 million people were driven from their homes, further destabilizing a nuclear-armed country. And the suffering that these people uh, go through is just uh, incredible. Beijing, China. Uh, I'll just run through these real quick. These are all from uh, China. This is uh, last summer in uh, Sichuan. And people just don't know what to make of this. These, water, these rescues lasted all day long and into the night. And I've got, I, I, I'll only show you that example. I'll show you one from Brazil, but um, it's a little different. But I mean, people are trying to come to grips with this. India, last summer. Rio. Homes 
that have been flooded out for seven weeks straight now. Uh, their records on, on these things go back 284 years. They've never had anything like it. And it's causing a crisis that their government may fall because of this. Matter of fact, I hope it does. <laughs> Gaza. So as this continues, the water cycle intensifies even more. Uh, bear with me uh, on this. The downpours get bigger, but simultaneously it causes longer and deeper droughts. And just to reiterate, the evaporation increases, the warmer air holds more moisture, the downpours are heavier, the flooding is worse. New element, the snowpacks melt earlier in the year, so the water's not available in summer and you get these big spring floods. And drought-prone areas get more droughts uh, because the water uh, evaporates from the topsoil. So here, here is the reason the same extra heat, those 400,000 Hiroshima bombs worth of extra heat every day, sucks the moisture out of the top several centimeters of the soil. So we get these enormous droughts. A couple years ago in China, this was an epic uh, drought. This is the largest lake in China, as it appeared uh, uh, three years ago. Both Koreas, again, uh, worse drought since they have kept records. And of course, uh, the drought uh, two summers ago in the U.S., last summer was awful bad too. Uh, you remember this was a real uh, exceptional drought. And what's going on this month in California, and really for the last three years in California, uh, they just announced, you know, that California is our biggest agricultural state. The farmers are not getting any water this year. And you think about that. This is, uh, uh, this is 95% of the state, moderate to exceptional drought. And a lot, some of the reservoirs, the driest year uh, ever recorded in California. They're getting extremely worried. You know, they had some big rains uh, two weeks ago, and it just didn't wasn't enough to make a difference. Jesus, it's so unusual in January to have a fire this intense. We understand the drought continues. This is the third year of an ongoing drought in Southern California, and we've kept records as it relates to rainfall for over 100 years, and this is the driest year of record. It's the driest and deepest drought on record in much of the West and Southwest, and getting worse fast. So drought, more heat brings more fire, and this is well known, not controversial in the research community. This is uh, the, uh, the average temperature in red and the fires. Uh, and so as it gets hotter, the vegetation dries out along with the soil uh, and it becomes kindling. Now this looks, this, is, this looks complicated, but I want you to just spend just a second looking at this. To me, this is a, a mind blower. A lot of this stuff is. But this legend shows this color here with a one degree C increase. And we're now headed toward a three degree, unless we wake up real fast. So in, the, in the, these areas, a 600% increase in the area burned by fires. And the others, you know, five to uh, more than 500%, 400%, 300%, the entire American West. How? how you know, so the question, do we have to do something about this? Yes, we do. Yes, there's a lot at stake here. And you may have noticed in recent years, these fires, and I talked to the, I've had conversations with these firefighters, and we're doing a program for first responders, but uh, they've never seen anything like this. Yosemite, you may remember, uh, was a terrible tragedy. These guys, uh, there were 19 of them killed in that fire. So this was Las Vegas last summer, looking over the mountains. A little bit ominous. What's over there? Well, this is the other side of the mountains. And Colorado, again, got some of the brunt of it. Hard to communicate what these people have been going the through. above Colorado Springs, a raging inferno devouring home after home. A thousand firefighters overwhelmed what they call a firestorm of epic proportions. 
It's as bad as it gets out there right now, door to door, street by street, firefighters inside, outside, trying to keep the flames away from buildings. With winds whipping at 65 miles an hour, flames exploded past fire breaks. It jumped two ridges and it moved three miles in less than an hour. The governor toured from the air and said it looked like a movie set. So, um, in Europe, Spain, uh, uh, again, droughts and fires in Eastern Europe, uh, uh, Portugal in Western Europe, uh, Macedonia and Montenegro. Uh, Australia's had uh, maybe been the hardest hit of uh, any uh, country with the drought, fire, uh, temperature. This was so-called uh, Black Monday, an iconic photo. I talked with these firefighters after this. They came to one of my events and they said that these fires are very different from anything we've ever been through. And they made a decision, they have a National Firefighters Union there, and they said, we're first responders to fire. We've decided we're going to be first responders to global warming. And they organized a relay, they organized a race across Australia, stopping in every town they went through to, to uh, present scientists and to tell what was going on here. Uh, this is just last month uh, in uh, Australia and in Perth uh, last month. Uh, this, as I said earlier, this was the hottest year ever. Cape Town, where I'll, I'll be uh, in three weeks, uh, has also been hit in Johannesburg. So this uh, is the prediction for drought intensification if we don't act soon. Again, do we have to do this? Yes. This legend shows blue from wet to these are red going to magenta and purple. That's extreme and exceptional drought. And the light purple is you don't even want to think about it drought. And as you go through, the, there are 20 computer models that all predict these results. Look at Southern Europe, would you? Uh, I'll come back to North America uh, it, just with this one slide. But uh, the biggest southern France, the biggest river in France, um, two and a half years ago, the Loire, the Garden of the Garden of France, they call it. Again, we've always had droughts, but you know this is really unusual and uh, and sustained. Egypt, uh, Senegal, drought, extended drought brings desertification all across the Sahel, and of course probably the most tragic area in the world with drought, except for Syria maybe, uh, it is part of Mogadishu, the ca catastrophic famine linked to drought. And again, the scientists link it to, now Syria I mentioned, Syria is a complicated story. Here's what people don't know, most people. From 2006 to 2010, 60% of Syria's farms turned into desert. A million climate refugees were driven into the cities where they crowded up next to a million refugees from the invasion of Iraq and the Iraq war. And, though, and that was the combustible mixture that led to the explosion of this horrific violence in Syria that is still getting worse. By 2010, 80% of the country's cattle had been killed. Here's a farmer, Ahmed Abdullah, at 400 acres of wheat that's now desert. Here's another guy. What do these people do? This was a WikiLeaks uh, uh, actually leaked this uh, cable. There are a bunch of them. Uh, Tom Friedman in the New York Times uh, was on this. They were saying, uh, back when this drought was going on, this is going to destroy our country. We can't deal with it. How are we going to cope with this? So, um, Turkey, this is in China. Desertification has uh, uh, affected dust storms. This is from uh, Phoenix a, a few years ago. They had six of these that year, called Naboo's. 
Um, this cameraman's going to pick up and move here in a minute. <laughs> This one's in Lubbock. The Dust Bowl is coming back. Again, unless we act quickly. This woman's stepped out on her back porch. She said it's climbing. The Amazon, uh, a million acres uh, uh, dried out. A million square miles, rather, I'm sorry. Uh, and this is uh, worth its own slideshow, but I I'm just going to move on. The, the Arctic, as you know, uh, the sea ice extent has re reached record uh, lows uh, in, the, in the summertime, uh, and it's gone from this to this. This has a lot of knock-on uh, effects. Uh, last summer in uh, Alaska, I was up there, 96 degrees north of Anchorage in bikinis out on uh, the beach. That's not normal. Now, this is happening because the whole climate system moves heat from the equator and the tropics to the poles through weather systems, the jet streams, the ocean currents. Uh, and when the average temperature increases by five degrees Fahrenheit, that's just one degree at the equator, but 12 degrees uh, at the North Pole. So all of these patterns change and that appears to be happening. This is something the scientists are still trying to figure out, uh, but the jet stream that comes across North America, you may have noticed that our weather's been really crazy. The jet stream is getting a lot wavier and these storm systems are moving more slowly uh, across North America. And, and it's, it's fractionating, it's getting chaotic, uh, and... We've got a huge ridge, or a big northward swing in the jet stream up into Alaska that caused rain to happen for the first time on the north slope of Alaska in December. They've never seen rain happen before, so this ridge is pumping a lot of warm air up there. So this is uh, one of the patterns that we saw where we get these extreme low temperatures but extreme hot temperatures uh, on the other side of this pattern. 52 miles of highway closed. Now this is a big deal, I'm not gonna spend any time on it, but as the Arctic warms up so rapidly, there's a lot of frozen methane. But there's a lot, whether we will be or not, is the question we've got to answer here. So this is the Columbia Glacier. I'm not going to show more than two of these. But all over the world, the mountain glaciers are uh, disappearing uh, in, in South America as well, in Europe, everywhere. Okay, so quickly, in South America, this is uh, a big deal for sea level. When John and I were down there, we had all these scientific experts, and one of them showed us this. This is the accelerated melting of the ice sheets. Uh, this is uh, the fastest melting glacier anywhere in, in the world. This is a sleeping giant that is a big deal uh, where sea level is concerned. Ice sheets rest on the ocean floor and can melt from both above and below sea level. We have warm waters that are near those ice sheets. And if those warm waters actually touch the marine ice sheets, the marine ice sheets melt, and you have big changes in sea level. Same thing in uh, Greenland. This is an hour uh, compressed into 30 seconds. These glaciers are racing, some of them, uh, toward the sea. Those, build, those uh, ice boulders are the size of apartment buildings. So, uh, this uh, is, these are the cities most vulnerable to sea level rise in terms of population. Uh, if you look at the cities vulnerable in terms of assets at risk, Miami is number one on the list. New York, New York, number three on the list. And the insurance uh, companies are now saying, you're not gonna be able to get insurance in these uh, areas. 
and, and in the UK where they're having this. Bangladesh, another whole story. We had the environment minister of Bangladesh with us on the boat and we uh, hooked back to them. This is in Egypt where the Nile, as it, they're trying to build uh, breakwaters, but the, it comes up through the groundwater and brings salt into the soil. 30% of the agriculture in Egypt is in the Nile Delta and is at risk. And there are many places like this where sea level rise is causing quieter problems. We filmed this climate reality. The sea started coming in, into the, the room. So we were compared to leave the place, further the place, and find somewhere else. It, it's a bedroom to my wife. This is my own room. displaced young men and women who should work here and make their life have all gone away. We're experiencing erosion as much as between four and eight meters per year. We used to have structures along the entire coast of Adam. The majority of these structures are are now under the ocean. So erosion is massive. Now, global warming as a result of climate change is the main cause of the sea level rise we are experiencing. Now, we have no place to, to, to stay. As we came to see, all our land, our buildings and everything has been taken into the sea. That's why we are looking for a place to go. We do a good job we can hold it to 60 uh, centimeters uh, if we wait much longer it'll be in the neighborhood of four feet some scientists think more something a little less um, but it's a big deal so um, what are the systems vulnerable let's look at food first of all because this is where this is beginning to pop out the global food system has persistent surpluses in north america south america and australia Russia and Eastern Europe some of the time, the rest of the world's in deficit. But as we saw uh, last year and two years ago, the farming in the Midwest is already in trouble. This is the last sequence blown up of that drought intensification slide. The breadbasket of the United States is also the breadbasket of the world. Uh, again, this is all for the question, do we have to do something? Yeah, we do. Um, the drought in Russia in 2010 also caused a lot of uh, fires. 50,000 people died in Moscow from the smoke uh, inhalation, elevated death rates, uh, and the fires were a problem. But four months after this, they took all of their grain off the world markets. So did Ukraine and Kazakhstan. And as a direct consequence, we had the second record price hike for food in three years. And this caused food riots in poor countries in many places uh, in the world. And at that moment, by the way, that was uh, uh, the moment when in Tunisia the food vendor set himself on fire. A lot of other factors involved there. But the stress of higher food prices uh, in, in poor countries is quite severe. Heat stress uh, alone on food crops are uh, uh, beginning to hurt yields uh, and can have a very significant uh, uh, effect uh, on yields. When we had that big heat wave in Europe, people focused on the, the uh, 70,000 people that died, 
But look at what happened to the agriculture. And th these are in the range of the yield losses that the scientists are now predicting. Uh, and it increases plant pests. We don't hear much about uh, cassava, uh, tapioca, uh, for example, but it's a huge uh, food crop that's very much at risk. And the higher CO2 alone uh, is favorable to the pests. So water. The water system, I said before, is being disrupted. But the water we consume, a little over 10 percent is uh, for domestic use, a little under 20 for industrial, vast majority for agriculture. So these are the countries, including the U.S., where we are overpumping the groundwater in catastrophic amounts. Texas, um, Kansas, here uh, in uh, Nebraska, Colorado, and elsewhere. But in some of these areas, uh, you know, they're using an average of five to six million gallons of water for natural gas fracking wells. Hello, that's not going to work. Um, you know the story of what happened with Lake Chad sending refugees uh, into Darfur. And the underlying theme of this part is the conflict uh, that is caused when people are competing over resources that are damaged by climate. Uh, some of the historians of the Bible say that the story of Cain and Abel uh, is partly a story of the conflict between herders and farmers. And all across uh, the Sahel uh, in Africa, there is a conflict between herders and farmers. This is another one of our short two-minute films here. Rain every April and March in some places. Every August we get rain. Every December we get short rains. But nowadays there is no that problem. You will only manage to get showers possibly two years after two years. Showers, not rain. This level are twice. Mean everything. There is no fish nowadays. Let me tell you. The fish need deep water. So that's why we go and get fish. The rain drops somewhere, all of them go there, and others who don't want others to come to their side. So they kill each other because of grass and water. In the case of the lake, I blame the European government for blocking the Daouma River. For the rain, possibly we will, we will blame the Western world. Because uh, I think the impact of their factories which have contributed the climate change. They all say that I will call them. It will never end like a lake. That's what our people usually say. Then when you want to say this thing cannot finish, it's just like that. They have to come. But the way the lake is moving, I think that's the idiom. We lose many. So finally, uh, the impact on health systems. The balance between human beings and microbes and bacteria is mediated by climate. One of the reasons civilization has advanced in the colder climate areas as much as it has is they're free from, relatively free from the, the diseases that are killed by the cold weather. 
But these tropical and subtropical diseases are now finding friendly pathways to go elsewhere. And we're seeing uh, real big problems of uh, malaria. Uh, asthma, you think, I mean, you know, uh, I don't have asthma, but people that do, or allergies. Here's what we had in 2000 uh, and what's projected. This is, uh, for a lot of families, a big deal. So we know we have to change. The answer to the first question is, yeah, we have to change. We can't have more of these damn wars in the oil-rich regions uh, of the world. We, we, have, we, have we can't have more uh, of the disasters like the one in the Gulf of Mexico uh, that is still, I mean, the cost is still being added up. And the number of oil spills, it's unbelievable. Here's a small one in Arkansas. This is just a guy in the neighborhood. So that is a pipeline that is busted. Exxon Mobil pipeline. And it's flooded the neighborhood. With tar with heavy tar sands like oil. All the way to the drain at the end of the street. Not from the tar sands. Um, luckily, our house is here, which is seemingly unaffected, but the smell is unbelievable. I mean, look. Incredible. And that is oil. So the head of ExxonMobil uh, said this last summer. What good is it to save the planet if humanity suffers? I'm not sure where to start on that. Uh, but you look at what this air pollution is doing from burning coal, fossil fuels in China, this is from Weibo. Five and a half years cut from the life expectancy in northern China. That's why there, two days ago, the state-owned media in China criticized the government. I've never seen that happen before for not doing more about uh, the air pollution from burning coal. Today, there was a story that in Beijing and Shanghai, the air pollution is 11 times higher than the safe concentration. Not just a little bit higher, 11 times higher. They cannot continue to do this. And we can't either. We don't have, we've cleaned up our conventional air pollution, but a lot of places like India. Uh, this, here's, here's an example, just bear with me. Salt Lake City. Salt Lake City. In 1985 and 1986, here's a big polluting plant in that valley there. It busted up, had to go down for repairs, and so they had to, they cut way back. And then in 87, 88, they went back to normal. Interestingly enough, in the hospital admissions for bronchitis and asthma and for pleurisy and pneumonia, you see a connection there? We have got to address this. But they keep telling us coal is clean. 1921, clean coal. 1945, clean coal. 1974, clean coal. 79, clean coal. 88, clean coal technologies. We've got an upgrade here. 2009, clean coal, cool. With sunglasses, what does that remind you of? Now, 2013 and 14, they're still doing it. Now is the time for clean coal. Also clean. Is regular clean clean enough for your family? Now when you can have clean coal clean. Clean coal harnesses the awesome power of the word clean. To make it sound like the cleanest clean there is. Clean coal is supported by the coal industry, the most trusted name in coal. The Cohen brothers did that for me. The cost of carbon is getting pretty dang high. We need to put a price on carbon in the markets and a price on denial in politics. Still, there are those who try to cloud 
the truth, you know, and say that there's no scientific consensus. Here's just one uh, congressman. We don't know what those other cycles were caused by in the past. Could be dinosaur flagellants, you know, or who knows? Who knows? Could be dinosaur flagellants. <laughs> but every single academy of science in every country on this planet agrees with the consensus. The ones that don't agree don't exist. And here is what they said as a group to the governments of the world. The need for urgent action is now indisputable. Every major scientific society in the world agrees with the consensus. Not a single one disagrees. The scientists that write peer-reviewed papers over the last, it's been 97, 98%. Over the last uh, two years, uh, here is the breakdown. 9,136 peer-reviewed studies agree, one does not. And it was not written by Galileo. <laughs> so we face a real turning point. Can we change? Can we do it? Yes, the answer is we can. In Malawi, some of you may know the story of William Kamwambe, 14 years old, had to stop going to school because his parents couldn't pay the tuition anymore. He found a popular science magazine with a blueprint for a windmill, scavenged the parts, and provided electricity for his home for the first time they'd ever had it, and then built some more and, and uh, provided electricity for the entire village. If he can do that, that really kind of ought to be a clue. We're building larger windmills. This one can provide electricity for 6,000 homes. The largest windmill array in the world is now uh, in the Thames. It will provide power for almost 500,000 homes. This is happening all over the world. Kenya, Morocco, Turkey, uh, India is quadrupling uh, their uh, wind power. China is busting all the records. Mexico is moving. And of course, in our country, uh, it's coming along. Solar uh, energy. This is the big game changer. This is really bringing about a revolution uh, in energy, and I'm going to show you why. But I want to talk to the, well, wait a minute, let me go back to that one. Wait a minute. Uh, the Vatican has set out to be the first CO2 neutral nation. They, they have two advantages. They have two advantages. They're very small. And God is on their side. And incidentally, how about that Pope? <laughs> but here's an example to remember. Back in 1980, Ma Bell did a big study of these big these bricks, the mobile telephones that came on the market. And they came up with their conclusion that by the year 2000, there would be a market for 900,000 of those phones. They were off by 120x. They sold over 100 million, or the industry did. Now, they're, now it's up to 5 billion. So here's the question. Why was the leading authority in this industry not only wrong, but way wrong? Four factors. Number one, well. <laughs> I thought that thing looked so cool. They didn't, they didn't count on the cost coming down as quickly as it did while the quality improved and the purchasing decisions were in the hands of individuals and the developing countries and emerging economies where most of the people in the world live did not have landline telephone grids. So the reason there are five billion cell phones out there now instead of uh, one million is because of these four factors. And this last one is important. Look at what's happening with solar now. And they're selling it by the hour, pay as you go. 
This is the poorest country in the world providing photovoltaic electricity for young kids with this, these uh, computer, $100 uh, computers. The solar photovoltaic production has gone off the charts, like the computer industry, like Moore's law. Here is it by country, in the US, in Germany, in Japan, in Taiwan, we know about China, but look at the rest of the world. That's where the big story is. But in the US, look at what has happened. It started slowly, it's an exponential curve. And you know what that means. It gets bigger as, and, and faster as it goes along. There are companies out there now that, in many states, that will come and say, I'll put solar panels all over your roof and your bills will go down 25, 30% the next day. How much will it cost me? Nothing. We'll do it for free. And that's their business model. I was on my houseboat last summer on Center Hill Lake in Tennessee, and early one morning when the fog was on the water, I was up on the top deck drinking a cup of coffee, and these two fishermen came by, and one of them said, you know, how sound carries in the water. He says, hey, is those solar panels up there on that roof? And I said, yeah. He said, you know, those things getting pretty damn cheap. I'm going to get one for my house. And I thought, that's better than a McKenzie survey. <laughs> And here is the reason the cost is coming down sharply on a continuing basis. Now this is one of the most important uh, stories of all. Look at this. These are the countries, as of two years ago, where the price of photovoltaic power is equal to or cheaper than other electricity. As of the end of last year, 31 countries now can get photovoltaic power from the uh, from electricity equal to or cheaper than the grid average price. As much energy from the sun hits the surface of the earth in each and every hour to equal the entire world's energy use for a full year. We just got to keep getting better at, with the efficiency that we convert it into electricity. And this is happening. This is a game changer. I don't care what the politics are. I don't care how powerful the coal industry is. There's a big difference between cheaper than and more expensive than. The, the difference between 32 degrees and 33 degrees is a difference of more than one degree. It's the difference between ice and water. And the difference between cheaper than and more expensive than is, is what that guy in that fishing boat was talking about. What that family that lives in that African hut is talking about. What those kids in Sierra Leone are, are, are talking about. And this is what happens over the next six years. By the year 2020, 85% of all the people in the world are going to live in countries where solar electricity is equal to or cheaper than the grid average price. countries like South Africa, uh, for example. It would be cheaper than today, except that they subsidize coal and subsidize kerosene. $500 billion a year spent by the world in subsidizing uh, this bad uh, energy. And we've got grand scale projects that are on the drawing boards to connect the solar areas of North Africa and the Middle East to Europe and Sub-Saharan Africa. Morocco is leading the way in preparing for this with these vast solar farms. In 2010, for the first time in world history, the cumulative investment in renewable energy exceeded the investment in fossil fuels. In yeah. the last couple of years, that's a flip back, but it's now moving back uh, in the right uh, direction. But we've got to have policies, get rid of those subsidies, and start encouraging the world to move in the right direction. So what about our country? We're the natural leader of the world. Why are we sitting on our asses in the United States, not doing anything? Because the coal, oil, gas, polluting uh, industries are using lobbying power and smoke screens, spending a billion dollars a year to try to blind people to the truth. They're not only using the playbook of the tobacco industry, they're using a lot of the same people the tobacco industry use. There's, a, there's all been documented. The, the tobacco companies hired actors and dressed them up as doctors and put them in front of television cameras with scripts to say, I'm a doctor, I smoke cameras. There's no reason why you need to worry about it. So, 
The debate is settled. We need uh, to act, and people are acting. These are the coal plants that were proposed over the last decade in the United States, and because of grassroots resistance, these are the ones that have been canceled. We are seeing a real change. We are seeing some policies in some regions uh, that are making a difference. Also uh, in Europe, uh, and Europe is, uh, is, is actually uh, moving forward. China just started this year a cap and trade system in five cities and two provinces and announced it's going to go nationwide uh, next year. They banned the burning of coal in these three cities. Now, they, it's a good news, bad news story. They need to do more, but the new president of China is uh, committed to doing more. Now, I, I showed you that about the telephone uh, market projections. This was what they projected uh, just 10 years ago uh, for, well, uh, let's, let's see, 15 years ago for U.S. wind capacity. We beat that projection four years ahead of time and exceeded it six times over. This was the projection for worldwide wind capacity by 2010. What's actually happened, that goal has been exceeded 10 times over. This was the, the uh, projection in the year 2000 for Chinese wind. That projection was exceeded 22 times over and will be exceeded 75 times over in the next few years. This was the projection uh, by the Bloomberg uh, market organization for the global solar market, how much would be added uh, each year by 2010, 17 times uh, exceeded. And this year alone exceeded 39 times over. We are moving, we are seeing a dramatic revolution. This was the uh, projection uh, for Chinese uh, solar. They doubled in it by and 24 times over uh, just this past year. So finally, what can you do? And this is the ask. Number one, speak up. Win the conversation. Do not let denial go unchallenged. I remember back when I heard that Dylan song that I started with. Not long after that, one of my friends out uh, in Smith County made some racist comment. Another one of my friends spoke up, spoke up and said, hey man, we don't talk that way anymore. And that changed in millions of conversations throughout our country. Last year, there was a press story about two gay men holding hands waiting for a pizza, and some homophobe walked by and made a nasty comment, and according to the reporter, literally every other person in that line turned on him and said, shut up, we don't accept that anymore. We are winning that conversation. We have more to do, but we have to win the climate conversation. So deepen your commitment and make choices in your own lives about the products that you buy. Don't give up. It's important to change the light bulbs, but it's more important to change the laws. And there is a two-part formula to, put, to putting useful, healthy pressure on politicians. I know whereof I speak. Part number one, if you do the right thing, I'm going to vote for you, I'll help you, I'll organize my friends, and I'll support you. If you do the wrong thing, I promise you I'll do everything within my power to make sure you are defeated in the next election. That two-part message actually works, so don't uh, uh, be shy about it. Write a song about what is right and what is wrong. telling you more about the Climate CD Project. We're, they're going to be reaching out to you in partnership with Climate Reality. We need your help. This needs to be focused uh, and resolved as a choice between right and wrong. It is a choice between right and wrong. Not too many years from now, the next generation, depending on the world they live in, will look back and ask us one of two questions. If they have all these floods and droughts and storms and climate refugees and tropical diseases and crop failures and failures of governance, what are they going to ask us? They'll ask us, what in the hell were you doing? What were you thinking? Why didn't you 
do something when you could? Were you watching Dancing with the Stars? What in the world were you doing? But if they live in a world where solar energy and wind and energy efficiency and sustainable solutions and uh, sustainable farming are the way of the world and there's hope in their hearts and they can tell their children that their lives are going to be better still, I want them to look back and ask God bless, how did you find the moral courage to rise up and shake off the lethargy and get active and get the thing solved? And part of the answer is going to be that folk singers and songwriters and artists and musicians spread the message around the world and woke up people to what's going on. Now finally, there's a lot at stake in this deal. This is our planet from five billion Miles away, Carl Sagan, when that spacecraft got out there, said, let's take another picture of the Earth. There it is, that pale blue dot, as he called it. A speck of dust suspended in a sunbeam. Do not let anybody tell you we're going to get on rocket ships and go to some other planet to live. They couldn't, we couldn't even evacuate New Orleans, for God's sake, or, or southern Manhattan. This is our home. We are going to make a stand here. Here we are under the rings of Saturn. This is a portrait from the Mars uh, rover. And this is the Earth rise. This is our home. We will make our stand here. I need your help. We need to accomplish this. Always remember that the only thing we need is the will to act. But the will to act is itself a renewable resource. Thank you very much. Let's get it done.